it's such an honor to be here. Um, and you know, I'm very excited to be sharing the latest and greatest um, uh, about serverless. And, and thank you, Pepe, for the warm introduction. Um, so, yep, so this is what we're going to cover today. Um, let me, before jumping into that, let me introduce a little bit more about myself. I'm Nat Visoya Putra. Um, I am based out of Los Angeles. I lead our full stack engineering practice in North America and cloud first. Um, I'm a certified uh, master of technology architect in the MTA program and been with the firm for quite some time. <laughs> um, so like, you know, the, I am specialized in building cloud, cloud native and uh, modern stack, um, you know, including serverless, right? So that's kind of what part of uh, uh, one of my areas of expertise that I'm gonna share with you today. So a um, little bit of agenda, um, what we're gonna cover today. Uh, first, I want to uh, give a little bit of overview of serverless, what it is, right? For those who may or may not be uh, too familiar with it. Uh, so it gives a little bit of primer for serverless. Then um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the, uh, the benefits of serverless. Um, you know, why, why it's becoming popular, why clients are using it, you know, and uh, why we should be in, um, uh, suggesting, right, or recommending our clients to, to consider them. And then want to cover a little bit about, kind of a little bit of comparison um, of, you know, serverless model and another uh, uh, type of compute, right, that uh, many of you may be familiar with, but the container. So a little bit of comparison, we'll talk about that. And lastly, I want to touch on the portability of serverless, which is one of the topics that uh, we get asked a lot when we uh, talk about serverless with our clients. So what is serverless? So serverless is an architecture, right? A type of architecture that utilize uh, cloud managed services. Um, you know, and, and, you know, kind of, you know, you go into the cloud, right? So instead of, uh, you know, you just using the VMs or infrastructures, right? So there are uh, cloud managed services as well, you know, from database, API, event logs, or even uh, the compute power, that's all uh, cloud managed. So I'm gonna show a little bit uh, of what, when we say cloud managed, what that means. But, you know, if you have heard of the product in AWS and Azure, right? Things like uh, Lambda functions, Azure functions, um, API gateway, uh, DynamoDBs, right? Or Cosmos. Uh, those are like examples of cloud managed services. Right, like these are uh, the tools and products that uh, is available as a service that you just consume it, um, so that you can build your uh, logic application, right, and logic on top of those services and be able to deliver value quickly. Things that are of the platform nature, like infrastructure, things that I consider, you know, we consider not. Uh, uh, business value, right? Like, you know, scalings, maintenance, operations, all that stuff is being uh, uh, pushed or, or offloaded to uh, be the responsibility of the cloud provider. So what do I mean by that? If you look at uh, the layers of when you're gonna build uh, your application, right? So I'm putting to get a little bit of comparison here. Um, so if you look at that traditional, you know, you know on-premise bare metal uh, and, and environment, right? Where you own like the top to bottom, you own your applications, you own a platform that it runs on, you own the OS, you own the hardware, the physical bare metal servers, and maybe including infrastructure as well. So you own like the full top to bottom. Yes. When you go into the cloud or more virtualized environment, right? So you're starting to kind of offload the infrastructure and hardware to someone else, but you're still responsible for like the top layer stack. Same for container as well. Now, when uh, for the serverless model, all the underlying layer here, right? From infrastructure, hardware, OS, platform, all this stuff is none of your concern. 
uh, it, you know, it, it's the cloud provider, you know, made this, the, the platform available for you that, you know, all, all you need is to build your application, right? Your business logic on top of it. Um, so as you know, as you can see, like, you know, it, it's, it's much less responsibility, right? Um, a little bit to kind of, uh, give an example. Um, for those who may be familiar with a uh, containerized environment, right? There's, uh, uh, <clears throat> so you might be familiar with managed Kubernetes, for example, um, to, and we're, we're opinionate about this, right? If you're the tool that you use, um, you still have to, uh, worry about or need to configure, you know, OS image, you need to worry about what JVM version I'm going to use. How do I open HTTP, you know, server, all that stuff. If you still need to, uh, uh, need to manage these concerns to our definition, this is not serverless, right? Just to, I, I want to just point this point out to uh, show like how opinionated it is in the terms of serverless. <clears throat> What are now, what are the benefits of serverless, right? To kind of why, why this is becoming popular, why clients are, uh, you know, using this, right. And then a lot of our engagements are to move this direction. So the benefits drives in one of uh, the two, two things, right. The, the key to key main benefits, cost reduction and the agility. So from cost reduction, as you, uh, that I, uh, if you, you think of the back to the diagram that I showed you earlier, right? A lot of underlying concerns, like from infrastructure, from, uh, OS and all like the platform. Now it's no longer your responsibilities. So you don't need to spend, you know, effort and energy and time and even money on maintaining the servers, right? The things like patching an OS, patching your platform upgrading your JVM, right? All that stuff, no longer your responsibility. So like when you switch to serverless, your infrastructure operation cost like drops significantly, right? Like I would say in some cases we can say virtually zero, right? Um, compared to like the traditional model, your application, uh, your system maintenance now, um, largely going to remain on the application maintenance, right? So bug fixes, you know, adding new features. And <clears throat> with that, it gives the agility to, to your, your overall, uh, development, right? You're, um, along the same line of thinking, right? Now, now that you don't have to, um, uh, worry about those concerns or, you know, OS software, how do I, you know, uh, what platform do I run and, and how do I, uh, manage securities on that stuff, your developers and engineers only need to, can focus to, uh, on, on the building out the application, right? Focus on things that are adding value so that with that, they can deliver features functionality much quicker. Right. So that drives the agility, shorter time to market. The other, uh, benefits here is the scalability with the serverless model and, uh, the pay per use and on demand model, um, the serverless, uh, architecture can scale really, really quickly. It's, you know, and if you look at some of the, uh, cloud provider, they even say it's virtually unlimited, right? Scalability, but you have to pay for it, but you know, you don't have a limit for scale, right? Mm -hmm. So things that you build, um, for today, maybe for like a pilot for a beta can scale to, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 to respond to a big demand, right? Easily without having to update or, or modify your architecture. Where have we, um, I want to point out like a, a quick case study to, uh, to, to give an example of, of those benefits, right? So this is, um, one of the, the engagements that we built using serverless. This is an engagement where Accenture, um, uh, co-create a new business with our client. So, you know, we want to develop a new product that needs to, 
uh, go into the market really quickly, right? With because you know uh, because of the uh, the competitive nature of the the business. So you know we didn't have time for this, right? To spend months and months on you know kind of like a traditional architecture, getting hardware in the data center and deploy. So we went with a full serverless, right? Use a lean and mean startup to uh, and lean engineering. Um, and serverless. So we were able to build out a prototype in eight weeks with like production grade, right? Because we're handling uh, customer data um, and has data privacy, all that stuff built in. Like we could build it within eight weeks. And with the new paradigm, you know, with the initial eight weeks release, we had um, um, twice a week uh, production release, right? Many of you heard this, this might be like a lot different from what you're doing today on your project, but that is the beauty of serverless and the new modern engineering, what it can do um, on the project. So um, for the interest of time, I can't go in a full detail if you need more, if you'd like to hear more about this uh, case study, uh, feel free to reach out to me and you know we have some more material we can talk through um, uh, uh, more in, in, in depth on that. Um, okay, so serverless, like I talked a lot about how, why is it good, you know, um, the benefits and, you know, it's the latest and the next best thing. Um, it is not a silver bullet, right? It is, uh, uh, just like everything else is, there's no, there's no silver bullet in, in, uh, in technology. There are use cases that serverless works well, and there are use cases where you may want to consider, you know, a different solution. Um, so this, I, we, I put together, and this is kind of like an example of a uh, comparison between two model of how you built your application, right? So if you built uh, one side is the function as a service, which is, you know, a type of serverless, like, you know, think of this as kind of like a Lambda or Azure function. Um, and uh, in comparison with a service orchestration, right? So this is kind of uh, like the Kubernetes or containerized environment. So when um, you, like there are a couple areas that you, you know, want to validate and evaluate before you decide, you know, if the use case fits for serverless. So I want to talk through this real quick. Um, first is the workload pattern, right? So serverless, and, and then this kind of generally apply to a lot of serverless components. Uh, it handles a lot better when you have a lot of spikes, right? Like, uh, like, a, like a demand and spikes in, in traffic volume. Um, when I say spike, this mean, you know, if you think of like, you know, a website, right. Like you built a website where normally, um, you know, you might have, you know, a hundred, 200, you know, concurrent users. And once in a while they run a marketing campaign and you might get millions of people that, you know, trying to click and open up the website at the same time. Right. And then that goes away within like an hour or two hours. So it's like that, that's that kind of spike that I'm talking about. Uh, serverless handle that, that those kind of situation very, very well um, in a, in a cost-effective manner as well uh, compared to containerized environment. But um, if you have sustained load, right? Like, you know, you, uh, you build a website, web application that you, you know, you know you're going to have between, you know, 2000 or like, you know, 2000 to 2500 users concurrent at all time, 24 seven. Um, interesting enough, like in that model, actually containerized environment is actually more cost effective. Um, we can do a calculation to show that, but you know, that, that's, the, uh, that's, that's the number you can see from, from the cloud provider. The, the other area that you want to also look at is application footprint. Um, you know, when you build your application, your code, uh, function as a service, a serverless, uh, compute has some limitation, right? Like, you know, it, it's, it's, and it's, um, it's common across all the platform, like the, um, and each provider has different limits. Um, uh, Azure function, I believe has like 250 megabytes of, of a payload for your application. 
uh, AWS, I think, has slightly bigger. And these things change over time too, right? Uh, AWS Lambda used to have used to have uh, you know low limits to like 250, 500 megabytes, and uh, they just up to 10 gigabytes recently. So we're going to talk about it about uh, the evolution in, in, in the next slide as well. But um, uh, the footprint, right? This is something you you need to to be mindful about. And for function as a service, the way that it um, gets um, uh, called, um, you want it to be small because you know you want it to spin up really quickly. So you want to keep it small. So when you deal with something, you know, really uh, big. Uh, uh, application, you have machine learning and like that's kind of libraries, right? You want to con consider a different uh, model like containerized environment. Um, the other area that, that also important is the, uh, the asynchronous call, the synchronous and asynchronous call, right? Serverless, like for example, function as a service, you pay for the, uh, uh, the all the time that your function runs, no matter what you actually it, whether if it's actively doing any processing, right? So if you build a function that you know when you call and your function needs to go grab data from somewhere else, um, you know, and, and wait for external you know party to return back, right? While that function is not doing anything, but it's waiting for response from the third party you still on the hook to pay for, for those time as well. So if you have a, uh, 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 a scenario like, like that, right, maybe function might, might not be the most cost effective for you. And lastly, um, the platform limitation, right? And I can say this applies to almost of the, the serverless. So you're gonna, while it gives the benefit of, you know, um, abstracting the details that you have to deal with, right, that I talked about earlier. You don't have to worry about OS version, JVM version, all this stuff. The way that it abstracted it is by design from you, make it easier, but also give the limitation as well, right? Um, it's going to prescribe like, okay, you can, you know, the, the you can work with uh, certain um, uh, versions of the, the platform that's available to you, like, you know, node version, uh, it, it has node version 12, 14, 16 available. If you want to use like the latest and greatest version 17, for example, then you know, you're, you're out of luck for, for serverless, right? You're gonna have to wait until that becomes available or you're gonna have to go to a containerized environment. So, um, you know, if, if you work with the with options that they provide and then serverless works really well, if you need more flexibility, you're probably gonna have to look for um, uh, containerized environment. So hopefully give that an idea of, you know, uh, my point here is, you know, it, while there's a lot of use cases that uh, serverless shines and works really well, but it does not, it's not a silver bullet. So you have to really evaluate and make sure, you know, your use case fits, uh, fits serverless. Um, to continue on to like the last point that I made, I made about uh, uh, the, the, the limitation, right? Yes, limitations are there, but serverless products, you know, quickly and, and evolves very, very quickly. Some things that you maybe cannot do today or you don't, you want, but you did not provide today, it's, you know, typically change, you know, in, in, in the, you know, quick near future, right? Especially if something that you're looking for is, is this uh, common, across, you know, other, their, their, their clients, their customers, right? Like, you know, and the features and demand gets picked up and developed, um, really quickly. Um, so yeah, I give these are on, on the slide here is an example of, you know, like a big features that, um, AWS Lambda, right. Provide a support, right. Um, before 2016, you can't, you know, launch Lambda and VPC and then you know, and then, and then now they, they made that available or, you know, you, before 2020, you, when Kafka becoming more and more, um, uh, uh, common, right. They add a support for, um, uh, Kafka manage Kafka events, right. And to, to trigger a Lambda function, for example. So point here is things change, things change quickly. Something that you cannot do today, maybe on this project, you can't use um, uh, serverless or, or Lambda for a certain reason. 
um, you know, when you move on to next engagement, maybe double check again, right? Maybe things changed and um, maybe that hurdle or, or what you're looking for has now become available and, you know, you can consider it for your, your engagement. Um, the next topic is, you know, like, I think it's going to be kind of the last topic that I want to leave with is uh, this conversation when we trying to um, uh, push an idea of serverless to the clients, uh, I typically get asked about vendor locked in, right? Like if I go with serverless, sounds like I'm going to be locked in with this provider. Like if I use Lambda, I've used DynamoDB, that means I am locked into uh, to AWS, right? For, for a long time. And, uh, and, you know, sometimes, you know, the clients, especially like non-technical, uh, client executive, right? This sound, this sound, this doesn't sound good from the business perspective, right? You're locked into like a vendor. That means, you know, you're, you're, you're kind of, uh, <laughs> at the mercy of, you know, their cost, their price and business and all so on and so forth. Right. So. So this is kind of like a question I get asked quite a bit and I want to uh, give you some, some key pointers to have that and prepare and, and respond to that kind of conversation. Um, so serverless, you know, it's kind of like the concept uh, the, the question of portability, right? If you build uh, your application, serverless application for a certain um, uh, uh, cloud provider, like, you know, you build your, your serverless application on AWS, can it be port to um, another cloud provider like Azure or, or Google Cloud platform, right? Um, so the answer to that is actually serverless is portable, but I put an asterisk for it, right? It's in a way that it is portable, but it's not free. It's not like you can copy everything and um, you know run a command and deploy to your cloud provider right away. Um, it is portable in the sense that um, it can be migrated, right? But it's not free. So there's some work that you need to do to um, kind of refactor the interfaces around it so you can deploy it to another cloud provider, right? A lot of time this, you know, related to the interfaces of your serverless application, how it interface with, uh, how your code interfaces with serverless components, right? Um, uh, major cloud providers these days, you know, Azure, AWS, Google, GCP, um, uh, offer very similar products, like similar products, similar capabilities. They call it slightly differently and an interface and API to do this components are slightly different. So, um, you're gonna like, you know, you're gonna have to spend some time to kind of refactor the code to retrofit it with the, um, with the, the, with the, the new cloud provider, right? And this can be done relatively easily too. If you use abstraction layer, um, use, um, you know, if you follow like, uh, hexagonal architecture, right. Um, you're not familiar with that. Highly recommend you look into it. Uh, actually when for build any, any application use hexagonal architecture, so you can shield your, uh, core logic business from, you know, the ports and adapters, right. So this will help you um uh, uh uh move if migrate if needed um you know relatively easily and lastly is the trade-off um for agility and speed here one thing i would really if you if one thing that you could avoid avoid or want to avoid is don't try to build a serverless application that can uh be deployed simultaneously to a different cloud provider. Like if you build a serverless application that, you know, can, and you, you know, build in, you know, the wrappers and, and all the, uh, the code and magic around it, where it can be deployed to any cloud provider at the same time, or all of them at the same time, right? While this is possible, it is from our experience, um, you are going to end up with a very complex architecture. We've, we've seen this, so I've seen, I can say this because I've seen it. Um, you're going to end up with, you know, very complex architecture and it's going to become expensive and it defeats the purpose of um, the serverless, right? It's supposed to make it simple and then reduce the complexity. Um, by doing that, you're going to lose your agility 
um, that that is kind of like a true benefit of serverless. So if that's one thing that I have seen and then, you know, don't want to see anyone uh, trying to attempt to do that is, uh, uh, you know, to, to, to do what you said, right? And build, build a serverless that can be deployed anywhere. Um, okay. So hopefully that gives you, you know, a good, quick, you know, overview latest and greatest uh, about serverless, um, you know, where uh, we have used it, the benefits, um, you know, and we have a lot more case studies. We've done this uh, at many, many, many places and for like many industries and many uses. So um, if you're looking for examples, reference architecture, case studies, uh, feel free to reach out to me. Um, you know, um, um, myself or my team will be happy to, to assist uh, uh, you know, you on, on your engagement. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, you know, it's an honor to, to be, uh, coming share my, <laughs> uh, stories about serverless with you today. Uh, thank you very much.